Now, I really want to concentrate on the SPU because the GPU most people get generally. They get that you send the base2 number to the GPU and it produces a color, a pixel on the screen. Or, you know, you send that base2 number to the CPU and that could be used in a calculation. We sort of understand how they work. And I found that sound eluded me a little bit. And I wanted to make sound simple because sound is actually one of the simplest mediums to work with when you consider your computer. But we kind of complicate it and I never knew how they actually worked until I finally looked into it and realized it was so simple. So let's have a look at the concept all the way from the base two number that's being sent to your SPU and then it goes all the way down the line through the aux cable and then eventually it ends up at a speaker and then it produces sound. How does this actually work? Well, we have a base two number, a number consisting of ones and zeros, that gets sent to the SPU, the sound processing unit. Now the sound processing unit takes those units, takes those ones and noughts, and what it does is it produces an electrical charge, a current. And that current flows down this cable right here. It goes into that jack, and it flows all the way down this cable. Now this in and of itself will not produce a sound. No sound is yet being produced until it hits the speaker. The speaker is the bit of hardware that really is going to produce sound. So how does this actually work? Well, once our headphones right here, or speakers, receive that voltage, receive that input, what happens is inside of these speakers, we have a cone. And that cone moves backwards and forwards. This is the bit right here in your ear. And it moves backwards and forwards. And what that does is it moves the air particles like my vocal cords now are moving the air particles and they're hitting the microphone, which is recording it, but they're also hitting your ears because they're coming out of your speakers and into your ears. So that is how the sound works, you move it backwards and forwards and depending on how far that cone goes or how near that cone is to the original position of the cone depends upon the charge. But how does the charge actually move the cone? Well, here's the interesting bit. It's all to do with magnets. Imagine you have a cone and inside behind it, you have a powerful magnet. It may be powerful, it may not be but you have a magnet inside of there. And then you have the cone. Now the cone's separate from the magnet. It's not attached to the magnet, but what you have is a coil, a large copper coil. So you can imagine what's going to happen to this charge that came from the SPU, goes down all the line, and then when it reaches your speaker, that charge goes into that copper cable wrapped around your cone what will happen is it will repel. It's going to actually push away from the magnet. And therefore, when it pushes, it creates a sound wave. It moves the air particles and it makes a sound wave. And depending on your base two number that came from the hardware, the larger the number is, the further away, the higher the charge, the higher the voltage will be from its original position. And the lower the number, the smaller that distance will be away from that magnet. So what you'll have is when you look at a sound wave like that, you, your cone will be going like that, depending on the charge, moving the air particles, making the sound. Nice and fun, and you can listen to Justin Bieber all you want. But however, if you listen to Justin on an 8-bit system or an 8-bit SPU, he will sound like an old arcade game gone wrong. We need more control over the charge that we give, aka more possibilities, in order for us to hear the music that we hear today. And that's because in the old arcade games, they sounded like a rattly tin can. Now we have a lot more range with our sound. And the quality of the sound is reflected by the distance between the magnet and the cone. On an 8-bit system, 
There are 256 possibilities, 256 places that cone can be away from the magnet. But then we go to a 16-bit system. Well, that means we have 65,536 possible base two number combinations. That also means if we have a 16-bit SPU, we have the possibility of 65,536 charges that can be sent down our aux cable and therefore we have 65,536 possible places where that cone can be from the magnet giving us more finite control over the vibrations of that cone making better sound quality so we don't have to stick with the tinny 80s arcade game music. But likewise, this lecture is not just about sound. You now know how your speakers in general are working to produce the sound in your ears. But what about the reverse process? What about the process that's happening right now with me being recorded? How do microphones record sound waves? Well, again, the process conceptually is actually very, very simple. You have all different types of microphones and the way in which they record may be slightly different, but their overall conceptual process is conceptually exactly the same. So in order to find out what's happening, what I need to do is reverse the process of a speaker. A speaker cone vibrates and it produces sound waves. But imagine me taking that cone and holding it up in front of my face and I start talking. Now my vocal cords are vibrating the air and what I'm doing with that cone that's right in front of me is I am pushing back on that cone. And therefore we've reversed the process. This cone now is not pushing to make sound waves, it's actually being pushed back to record sound waves. We're reversing the process. Now, your microphones don't use those types of cones. They use very thin material because they need to be very sensitive and very receptive. And depending on what type of microphone you have, you'll have different materials and so forth. I have a condenser mic and they're a little bit complicated, but the premise is very simple. For this particular microphone, it has two metal plates and they're very thin. The one that's at the back, that doesn't move, that stays still. But the one at the front is actually moved by my voice, by the air particles, and it moves backwards and forwards. Now, depending on how close that is, that's louder. And the further away it is from that plate, the quieter it is. So we're reversing the process. And that will produce an electrical charge. And that electrical charge can be sent down a cable, goes all the way down the cable. Your sound processing unit now decides it's not going to give off a charge, it's going to receive the charge and that charge will be processed and it will be turned into a base two number in memory and there are your sound bites in memory. Now the more expensive microphones don't necessarily just send down a charge. They actually do quite a lot of computation in themselves. They are like mini computers, if you will. They have their own chipboards and they even have sound processors in them. So what it does is it listens to the ambient noise, the noise that's around, and it targets the noise that's directly in front of it and it uses noise cancellation. And all of that processing that happens is actually done in the microphone itself. So the microphone is like a little mini computer, if you will. And this is a USB mic. You do have microphones that use aux cables. They're normally the cheaper microphones that you'll find, let's say, on headphones. But a USB microphone will usually be more expensive because it has its own chipboard, it has its own computation. And what it's doing is it's processing right in the microphone those electrical charges and it's producing base two numbers right in the microphone. And then it's sending those base two numbers down the USB cable this time and your computer receives that and stores it in memory. And then you can take those base two numbers and you can give them back to the SPU and it will play back the sound that you've just recorded. Or you could even take those numbers, those base two numbers, and send them to the GPU and it will produce an image based on the sound recorded. Because they're all base two numbers and after all you can send them wherever you want as a programmer. So this is why it's important to understand the process 
and to demystify really on the surface how these things work.